So let's talk about electron deficient bonding one last time in main group chemistry. So you've seen slides like this already. And what we essentially have in trimethyl aluminium and certain other aluminium alkyls is a situation where you can view it, if it helps you to simplify these, as essentially a combination of atomic orbitals on aluminium, sp3 hybridized orbitals on aluminium. And of course you know that aluminium has four valence orbitals, so it will have four sp3 hybrids, but it only has three valence electrons to start off with since aluminium is in group 13. Now you can form three bonds, but to have a vacant orbital is essentially not a favourable situation. It's more favourable when all orbitals are involved in bonding. But we can't just invent electrons to put into these orbitals. If you have an electron deficient compound, unless you add a Lewis base to it, it will stay electron deficient. But what it can do is it can produce this electron deficient bonding modes in order that all its atomic orbitals are engaged in bonding. And that's what happens in these electron deficient organometallic reagents like methyl lithium where we had four centre two electron bonds, like dimethyl magnesium where we had three centre two electron bonds. Here we don't need to have all our orbitals engaging in electron deficient bonding modes. Here we have two perfectly normal sigma bonds, two electron, two centre bonds between aluminium and a methyl radical species here. But between the two aluminiums, what we have are three centre two electron bonds, which are formed by two electrons occupying a molecular orbital formed through the overlap of three orbitals, two from aluminium and one from carbon. Now, do all organometallic molecules form these kind of bonds? Unfortunately not. I guess you would like to have a situation where you either always see them or you don't see them. Whether you see electron deficient bonding is a very subtle balance between Lewis acidity and steric demands of your system. So if you have a system that is very Lewis acidic, what you are saying is that it wants its orbitals to be involved in bonding. So very acidic elements like aluminium have a high propensity to involving all their uh, orbitals in electron deficient bonding. If you have uh, an element slightly less electron deficient like gallium, gallium is just underneath aluminium in the periodic table. So you might expect trimethyl gallium to have the same structure as trimethyl aluminium. It doesn't. Trimethyl gallium does not have bridging methyl groups. And as a consequence of that, trimethyl gallium is much more volatile, although it's a heavier on the face of it, it's not dimeric, so it's actually a much more volatile molecule than trimethyl aluminium, and that's quite important. If you have the potential to form a bridging halide, uh, bridging chloride, bridging bromide, bridging iodide, we encountered this last time. If that is possible, if that is present, then that will be favoured over a bridging alkyl group because, of course, a bridging chloride ligand is a, essentially a three electron donor, one normal sigma bond and it is dotedly donating a lone pair to the second metal. And by doing that, you no longer have an electron deficient system at all. So if there is a chloride, that will bridge preferentially. If there is a hydride ligand present, that will also bridge preferentially. But let's be very clear about this, hydride ligands don't have lone pairs of electrons. So please never ever draw it such in, in such a fashion that it looks like you've got a dative bond from hydrogen to another element. There is no lone pair to datively donate. Why is it that hydride ligands, as we say on this slide, are preferred to bridging alkyl ligands? So if you have a compound that is a dialkyl hydride, it will dimerize, and it will dimerize such that it's hydride ligands that are bridging, not alkyls. Well, that can be understood really quite easily from a steric point of view. It is much easier to get a hydride ligand between two metals than it is a bulky alkyl group between two metals. So a hydride is a preferred bridging ligand to an alkyl group. And that's why in the case of trimethyl boron, trimethyl boron is one place above aluminium, but again trimethyl boron does not form bridging uh, a dimeric compound with bridging groups because it's not as big or as Lewis acidic as aluminium. So both those things are working against it. However, if you have dimethyl boron hydride, 
Me2BH, that is a dimeric compound, just as borane, which you've already encountered, is a dimeric compound, and the bridging hydride, it, because you have a hydride to do the bridging, you don't, you're not relying on alkyls. So you have a hierarchy. Chlorides preferred to hydrides preferred to alkyls, and we should recognise that. Now, I said a moment ago that di trimethyl aluminium is not dimeric, and because it's not dimeric, that means it's much more volatile than trimethyl aluminium. And that volatility of trimethyl gallium is exploited in the semiconductor industry. So what this is, is an actual real plant. This is Embrombra near Liverpool. So if anybody comes from the northwest, this is a plant for the manufacture of trimethyl gallium. Now trimethyl gallium is more volatile than trimethyl aluminium and yet has this vacant orbital and polar bonds. Now I hope we recognise that as being a recipe for very high re reactivity and being pyrophoric. So trimethyl gallium is a very pyrophoric compound and in fact you can see here they've got just a very flimsy roof. Often plants made for the manufacture of trialkyl aluminiums, trialkyl gallium type compounds don't have any roof at all. That's because if the thing actually blows up, then it's not an in, in an enclosed space, and it's actually more um, <coughs> safer to have a roof that will come off very easily than to have a very robust building. So these things are actually either done with no roof at all or with roofs which are designed essentially to blow off in the result of some tremendous accident. So this is a real plant making real trimethyl gallium. What trimethyl gallium is used for is it's taken in combination with a volatile source of arsenic, um, arsenic trihydride is such a species. You react these two species together, and that's essentially a radical reaction. It's difficult to predict this one uh, any other way. This is a radical reaction, and what you produce is methane gas and gallium arsenide. And gallium arsenide is a 3,5, as it would be called, or 13, 15, as I would guess prefer to call it, semiconductor material. One other application of group 13 chemistry before we move on, and that is hydroboration. So hopefully you will have encountered hydroboration type technologies in 2C11. If you haven't done, then essentially hydroboration is a anti-Markovnikov addition of an HBr bond across an alkene. And by anti-Markovnikov, what we mean is that the boron goes to the least hindered carbon, the carbon with the, the greatest number of hydrogens on it. And normally, of course, Markovnikov addition means the hydrogen goes to the hydrogen, to the carbon with the most hydrogens at it. So it's anti-Markovnikov. It is also stereoselective. So where it's appropriate, you add in a cis fashion across your alkene bond. What's the point in that? Well, these alkyl borane compounds are accessible from hydroboration of BH functionality, so you can use it synthetically. But more importantly, this carbon boron functionality is very reactive. And you have a reactive carbon boron functionality. You can do all sorts of subsequent chemistry to it. So you can oxidize these species and you can couple the species together. And so it is a very useful, very versatile precursor to all sorts of organic synthesis. So um, if you haven't encountered it already in organic chemistry, you certainly will do. So there's our summary slide, hopefully useful with revision. What I want to go on to is talk about group 14 organometallic chemistry. Now, whether you realise it or not, you have come in very close contact on many occasions with group 14 organometallic compounds whereas you will never have come in very close contact with group 13 organometallic compounds because as we recognise, these group 13 organometallic compounds are extremely reactive. So why is that? The group 14 organometallic compounds are very low reactivity. Famous examples would be compounds like tetramethylsilane. What is Trimethyl aluminium, we've seen triethyl aluminium are pyrophoric, burst into flames spontaneously, and you practically can't put these things out. You might as well let them burn out. Tetramethylsilane is used for what? Yeah, tetramethylsilane is the definitive NMR standard for which nuclei? Proton, yes, any more? So tetramethylsilane is the NMR standard for proton. So zero ppm is defined as being the resonance of the protons in tetramethylsilane. Anything else? 
It is. Also, it is defined as being the zero point in carbon-13 NMR. Any more? Well, there is such a thing as silicon-29 NMR. Silicon-29, again, actually, TMS is the definitive reference standard for silicon NMR as well. But you couldn't put a highly reactive compound into your NMR samples. It would be stupid. It would react with them. You would change all the, the compounds here. TMS is not reactive. Another place where you would have encountered um, silanes is actually grease. Silicon grease is the high vacuum grease that we use in the laboratories. That is essentially a compound containing silicon carbon bonds. And that's used because it's not very reactive. It has an annoying habit of dissolving in your organic solvents and ending up in your compound, which is why your colleagues in, who teach 2C11 don't like it. But it is an organometallic compound that we use a lot in inorganic chemistry when we want to protect our glass joints from including oxygen. There's an obviously a big difference in the reactivity of group 13 and group 14. So what's the origin of this difference? Is it a thermodynamic factor? So what we're saying there, is it because one of two things, either aluminium to carbon bonds are much weaker than silicon to carbon bonds, or an, an alternative explanation would be that the product of these reactions, aluminium oxygen bonds, are much stronger than silicon oxygen bonds. Are either of those things true? Well, they're not, basically. If we look at this table here, what it's indicating to us is that the strength of these element, um, organometallic element boron, group 13 element oxygen bonds, or if anything, are slightly stronger, but they're very comparable to the strength of silicon oxygen bonds here. And if we look at the dissociation energies for the bonds here, you'll see that these, again, are very similar to bond strengths that you see in group 14 chemistry. So it isn't true. What is true is that thermodynamically, tetramethylsilane is unstable with respect to its oxidation products, which would be water, carbon dioxide, and silicon dioxide. And aluminium trimethyl is unstable with respect to its oxidation products, which would be water, carbon dioxide, and aluminium oxide. Well, one of them reacts spontaneously in the air, and the other one doesn't. I probably told you this before, but you and I, and these chairs, and these curtains, all of these things are thermodynamically unstable with respect to our respective oxidation products. And yet, uh, although you may read about it in the occasional scandal sheet or something, there is no such thing as spontaneous human combustion. We don't spontaneously burst into flames the moment we're exposed to oxygen, and probably a very good thing it is too. So we're all thermodynamically unstable, and yet we don't burst into flames. So clearly, what we're getting at is if it's not thermodynamics, it's that other one. It's kinetics. So there is a kinetic explanation why it is that group 14 compounds are stable and group 13 compounds are not stable. Now, there are two important factors that we need to look for. What you would immediately recognise is if I said to you, um, which is the strongest Lewis acid, trimethyl aluminium or, tri or tetramethyl silane, then you would say to me, Trimethyl aluminium is the strongest Lewis acid because it has a vacant orbital. So that is one very important factor. Having a Lewis acidic organometallic reagent or an electron deficient, it's the same way of saying the same thing. If you have an electron deficient organometallic compound, that is going to be more reactive than a compound that is electron precise that has an octet of electrons. So that's one important factor in predicting reactivity. And the other one is one that we've encountered a lot of times already in our chemistry career. It's the concept of polarity of a bond. So the more polar your bond, the more reactive it will be. And so if we look at a table of electronegativities, you would have seen something like this in, in the past. I don't know if Professor Botman introduced one, but you certainly saw this in the first year. This is a table of electronegativities. And we can use this table and the difference between the values in this table to predict how polar our bonds will be. So the important value here, since it's organometallic chemistry, is this value here for carbon. So the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5. 
higher the value, the more electronegative the element is. Incidentally, for reference purposes, fluorine comes in at about 3.9. Fluorine's by far the most electronegative, comes in about 3.9. Carbon's here at 2.5. And if we compare carbon to silicon, we have a 0.6 difference in the electronegativity. So that is a polar bond. It is polarized such that silicon is slightly positive and carbon is slightly negative. But if we compare that to aluminium, Aluminium has a lower value of electronegativity. Sometimes I'd say it's more electropositive. It's the same thing. So what we have here is a value of 1.6 versus 2.5, so a difference of 0.9. So we would predict that trialkyl aluminiums would be more reactive than tetraalkyl silanes for two reasons. One, the most important one essentially, that you have a vacant orbital on aluminium, and that essentially gives you a low activity, low activation barrier reaction route. And the other one is that the bond is more polar and so is therefore more reactive. And these two factors are both pointing in the same direction. So we've seen these, this is essentially a summary of some of the things that we've done here and putting it in the context of reactivity. So these main group alkyls that do not achieve an octet of electrons will participate in electron deficient bonding modes where sterics permit. So there are exceptions to this. And the one thing that I've been trying to stress through here, perhaps to the point of being a little bit um, repetitive, is that we can use the difference in electronegativities between our elements to essentially predict how the reactivity will go. And if we can predict how the reactivity will go, that's the same thing as essentially designing a synthesis of these compounds. So we know already that any... Uh, electropositive organometallic reagent. So an organometallic reagent from the left-hand side of the periodic table will react with an element halide from somewhere to the right in the periodic table to give us a new organometallic compound and a new salt. So you'll, that's essentially what we're saying here. So we can use the driving force as the difference in electronegativity between the compounds. And we have a few examples here. So examples would include the reaction of BX3 with or a Grignard reagent to you and I to produce new organometallics. Okay, and as I've just said, all of these compounds are thermodynamically unstable, but in order to predict which you're going to react, then we need to recognize the presence of vacant orbitals, and those vacant orbitals can be masked by the presence of electron-deficient bonding, but remember, electron deficient bonding does not add new electrons. They are still electron deficient, even if they are using all their orbitals. They're not using them to their full capacity and remain Lewis acidic species. And then secondly, the more polar the bond, the more reactive the species. So trimethyl aluminium is pyrophoric, but certainly so is methyl lithium, because in the case of methyl lithium, what we've got is a species which has individual polar bonds. Remember, the aggregates are not polar. We talked about that, but individually polar bonds. And it is certainly electron deficient because it's only a two electron species. Let's have a bit more descriptive group 14 chemistry. And I need so preparation of organosilicon reagents. Well, hopefully, you would have been able to tell me I can make an tetramethyl silane. I know how to do that. I'll just use methyl lithium four equivalents, and silicon tetrachloride. I'd expect you to be able to design a synthesis like this. You tell me it would also work if you use a Grignard reagent, because Grignard magnesium is also to the left of silicon in the periodic table, and you'd be absolutely right. If you basically stop the stoichiometry with two equivalents of an alkyl group and two halides remaining on the silicon, then those people who've done 2HO3, anybody who's done 2H11, who's heard of know something about sol gel chemistry. Anybody who knows something about these condensation type reactions will recognize that these silicon chlorine functionalities, polar silicon chlorine bond, will react with water. And it will react with water in the first instance to make OH compounds. Then these OH compounds, these silanols, will undergo condensation with another equivalent of a silicon chlorine bond to form a silicon oxygen silicon linkage. And then we still have functionality here. So essentially what will happen is we will generate very quickly a polymer through a condensation polymerization eliminating HCl. And what we end up then is what we would call a siloxane 
or a silicone. And silicones are really important materials. Silicone rubbers and oils are corrosion resistant. Once you get to this state, you've essentially expended all the reactivity in these species. They're corrosion resistant and they're also gas permeable. So gases can pass through them, but they won't themselves corrode. And so we end up with a whole series of different applications of silicones. What kind of silicone applications we can have? We have the obvious ones of things like silicone rubber sealants in the bathroom. I'm sure everybody has encountered these. Some people may have encountered um, silicone prosthetics, false parts of the human body made from silicones. Anybody got any applications that you think are, ought to be on that slide but aren't? What well, about under electrical and electronic applications? Anything ought to be on that slide that isn't? I started off this lecture by telling you how wonderful this 2C32 class was and how they attend. And I, you know, I've been proven right once again. Every other year I pose this question. Someone said, silicon chips. Why aren't silicon chips on that slide? Exactly. You see, you're just too good. Silicon chips are elemental silicon. Uh, not silicone. There's an E in silicone. And those are different compounds. They are dialkyl SiO polymers. They are not elemental silicon, which is the stuff that goes to make uh, computer chips. Right, after silicon in group 14 comes tin. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on this synthesis because I really think you should be able to work these ones out for yourself. Anything that is a more electropositive element will react with the metal halide to give you your organometallic. And so here we can even use group 13, which is to the left of group 14 as your organometallic reagents here. And you can make tetraalkyl tin or tetravinyl tin compounds here. What are 10 alkyl compounds good for? Well, they are good for anti-fouling agents. I think I mentioned this in the first year, but let's see if anybody can remember. What is an anti-fouling paint for? What does fouling of boats mean? It is where you get growths on the bottom of those growths being specifically barnacles, essentially, and crustaceans growing on there. And of course, if you do that, then the streamline hull of your boat is interfered with, and your boat can actually accumulate an awful lot of additional weight. So you don't want things to take to start living on your boat. Now, the problem, of course, is that anything that discourages crustaceans from growing on there, there's probably a good reason for that, and that's because these things are highly toxic. So tin alkyl compounds tend to be sort of phased out nowadays from many applications because they are quite unpleasant to know. If you get any tin alkyls on your skin, then it can immediately cause a very nasty rash. So tin alkyls are, tend to be quite high toxicities, but they still have a few applications. Uh, they used until, I'm not sure whether they're still used, but they were, certainly have been used as stabilizers for polyvinyl chloride, PVC, in these systems. Now, one application that the longer this course goes on, the older I get, the more I think, well, can I still get away with talking about lead alkyls? So many of you will uh, drive. I suggest, and you'll drive into the, the, the garage and you'll say to myself, well, I need to fill up the car with uh, fuel and I must use this uh, petrol, unleaded petrol and not diesel. But does everybody know why it's called unleaded petrol? It's because until really about 15, 20 years ago, it was, I think it's about 20 years ago, it was normal practice to add alkyl lead to the petrol. But of course, lead itself as a heavy metal is actually has a tendency to bind very strongly to sulfur. So the reason that lead is quite toxic is because lead will bind to sulfur. And why does that matter? We've got plenty of biochemists. They can tell us why that matters. Yeah, I mean, there are things like disulfide bridges uh, responsible for some of the structural aspects. But there are a lot of amino acids where the sulfur is not even participating in the disulfide bridge. Cysteine is an important amino acid in many proteins that are found in the brain. And so if you have heavy metals like mercury, but like lead, they have much greater affinity for sulfur than they do for oxygen. And they will get in there, they will interfere with the chemistry of the brain. So lead is a very toxic reagent. 
We know how to make tetraalkyl leads. We've used the same sort of chemistry that we did before. This is the industry. So in the laboratory, all you would need is a convenient lead for salt. And those who remember their uh, inert pair effect will know there aren't actually that many salts of lead in oxidation state four. Lead also largely exists in oxidation state two. But there are some stable salts of lead in oxidation state four. React those with organometallic reagents, we can make tetraalkyl lead. So that's what you do in the laboratory, very carefully. In industry, people use this kind of route. And there are still countries in the world, I believe in the Middle East, it is still normal practice to add tetraalkyl leads to petrol. Nowadays, we don't do it in the West. We have alternatives that are put in there. Do you know why it was done in the first place? Uh, it stops knocking. Knocking in a combustion engine is uncontrolled uh, combustion. What you want in a combustion engine is for the thing to burn under your terms when you want it to. And in the early cars, this was a big problem. They would make a, a misfiring noise, a knocking noise, because combustion was taking place under uncontrolled circumstances. What you need to do to control combustion is to increase the octane number of your fuel, and adding tetraethyl lead is a very effective way of doing that. How does it work? Well, it works through essentially the homolytic cleavage reaction that we've got here. So we talked a little bit. We're all confident in what is the, meant by the term homolytic cleavage, because this is fundamental chemistry that we should all know. I see a few people nodding and a few people staring right at me, giving nothing away. So if you don't know what homolytic means, then you'll be doing at least yourself and someone else a favour if you confess, and I'll explain. But otherwise, I'll move on, because we've got time. Thank you, very, very brave, very conscientious, and I'm sure you're not alone. What is meant by homolytic cleavage? Well, if we have a metal alkyl bond, then we can break that bond in one of two ways. And this concept is going to be very important on Monday. If I wanted to assign an oxidation state to this bond, then I would do a thought experiment that said I'm going to cleave this bond heterolytically, which means that the pair of electrons will go to the most electronegative element. So I would, if I cleave this bond heterolytically, then I would be making a metal cation and a carb anion. That is a heterolytic cleavage. If I cleave the bond homolytically, then I'm going to make two neutral radicals. So if I cleave the bond homolytically, then I make an M dot and an R dot species. So this is the process that you have to go through if you're going to assign an oxidation state. And this is the process that you go through when you're doing what we normally do on 2C32, which is covalent electron counting. Let's take us back to Lewis structure. Whenever you draw a line like that, what you're representing is a pair of electrons. That's what the line means. It's a bonding pair of electrons. And so if we break this bond and we take both of the electrons from the bond and put it with the carbon, then it will become negatively charged and the metal will become positively charged. Because at the moment, they're neutral because they've got one each. But if you give one to each species, then they stay, they stay neutral. This concept is important because it's fundamental to a lot of what we do and it's fundamental to what we do when we're assigning oxidation states. When you assign an oxidation state, you're doing heterolytic cleavage. If you're doing covalent electron counting, you're doing homolytic cleavage. Now, sometimes this actually re represents the chemistry that takes place. Often when, essentially, what is a, an acid? When something dissociates to, uh, and behaves like an acid, that's an example of a heterolytic cleavage, isn't it? Because it's cleaving to give you a conjugate anion and a proton. So that's an example of chemistry being a heterolytic cleavage process. In tetraethyl lead is an example of chemistry being a homolytic cleavage process. And what you generate are triethyl lead radicals and ethyl radicals. Why is that important in combustion? Well, combustion is a radical process. The mechanism of combustion is a free radical runaway reaction. That is what's taking place when something burns. It is a radical reaction. And so if you generate radicals, you, you initiate a combustion reaction and you do it on your own terms. So what putting tetraethyl lead does 
is generate radicals under a precise set of conditions in large quantities and start the combustion exactly when you want the combustion to start. And what we have to recognise here, and we'll come back to this later in the course, is that in tetraethyl lead, tetraethyl lead is a eight electron main group compound. It has an octet of electrons. It doesn't have a vacant orbital, and the lead carbon bond is not very polar. If it was very polar, it would be less likely to homolytically cleave, wouldn't it? So there is no other reactivity mode available to tetraethyl lead. Tetraethyl lead does not burst spontaneously into flames. Tetraethyl lead only decomposes if you heat it to 200 degrees in a homolytic fashion, and that's essentially because it's a pretty weak example of a metal carbon bond. And if you want to explain that, you need to consider the size of the orbitals doing the overlap, and this will be one of those efficient orbital overlap explanations. But I don't want to digress now because I won't finish the lecture. Organometallic chemistry of lead has been an incredibly important factor in the development of the chemistry industry and the development of organometallic chemistry. And that was commemorated with essentially covers like this and articles on tetraethyl lead. And you'll see the date there. That was 2004. This was obviously still recognised as being important long after tetraethyl lead was phased out of addition of petrol because essentially they realised that they were cumulatively poisoning the environment by doing so. Now after group 14 comes group 15. Group 15 will obviously include nitrogen. Well, nitrogen's not metallic enough, so triethylamines are not examples of organometallic reagents. Phosphorus is electropositive enough to creep in there as an organometallic trialkyl compound. But phosphorus, as we'll see in the transition metal chemistry, is more important actually as a ligand in transition metal organometallic chemistry, and I'll talk about it then. So if we move to antimony and um, arsenic in these compounds, you can have a really quite complicated chemistry of arsenic and of antimony and of bismuth, because they exist in oxidation states plus three and plus five. So you can have organometallic compounds which are in oxidation state plus three or plus five. Now, how do you make them? Well, many of you will say, well, if I want one in, in oxidation state, if I want bismuth trimethyl, trimethyl bismuth, what I would do is take bismuth trichloride and methyl lithium. And you would be right, you can do that, that would work. There is an important exception on, this on the next slide where you can't do that if you want to make bismuth-5 compounds, and we'll come to that in a moment. But you can do the, one of the other methods that we encountered, which is a so-called direct synthesis. So if you take bismuth metal uh, or arsenic metal and you expose that to uh, methyl bromide, what you get is dimethyl arsenic bromide and methyl arsenic dibromide. So you get two new organometallic reagents. What you don't get is complete alkylation. So the reaction does not go cleanly all the way through to the trialkyl compound. But you can then take these monohalides or dihalides and react them with organolithium reagents to mi make mixed compounds. So you can have access to mixed alkyl arsenic compounds fairly easily like this. You can, of course, do metathesis chemistry with any more electropositive organometallic reagent, meaning a Grignard reagent, meaning a lithium reagent. And the structures of these compounds are, well, what structure would you predict? It's a group 15 element with three alkyls on it. What structure would you predict? OK, uh, tetrahedral, yes, with one little word inserted in front of it. Pseudo, yes. Professor Bockman would have described these things as pseudo. So if we take arsenic here, then we have a lone pair of electrons on here. We have an alkyl bond, we have another alkyl bond, and we have a third alkyl bond. So these things are described as pseudo-tetrahedral, and we absolutely must not ever forget the lone pair because that makes this a Lewis base. And that's important because it makes it a ligand. So these are ligands in chemistry. And of course, if you don't want to describe it as pseudo-tetrahedral, you could describe it as pyramidal. So that's pseudo-tetrahedral or uh, pyramidal structure. What about oxidation state 5? Well, in oxidation state 5, we have a problem because we'd like to just take the element in chloride in oxidation state 5 and add five equivalents of, say, a Grignard or a lithium reagent to it. 
This is bismuth or antimony or arsenic or antimony essentially in these systems in oxidation state 5. And that is fairly easily reduced to oxidation state 3. And if you add something that is a very electron rich reagent like a methyl anion associated with a lithium cation, that's exactly what happens. It doesn't act as a metathesis alkylating agent, it acts as an electron reducing agent. And it will reduce your arsenic down from arsenic in oxidation state 5 to arsenic in oxidation state 3. So you have to have a trick. And the trick is this. What you do is you make trimethyl arsenic from the arsenic 3 precursor. You then oxidize the arsenic 3 precursor up to arsenic 5 using chlorine. And then you can do metathesis on the remaining arsenic chlorine bonds to make an arsenic 5 compound. And that doesn't have um, any odd electrons or uh, pairs of electrons. So we would predict it to have this shape. What do we call that one again? Yeah, it's trigonal bipyramidal structure. Now, there is a very famous gentleman who um, worked extensively in the chemistry of arsenic and indeed the organometallic chemistry of arsenic. So that's group 15 chemistry. We're racing along here, but I want to include group 11 in our consideration of main group organometallic chemistry. So group 11, well, why haven't we taken that in context? We looked at group 12 alongside group 2 and saw that there were some similarities but also some differences. They have not much in the sim way of similarities between group 1 and group 11, except to say that group 11 organometallic chemistry is almost exclusively, I'd like to say exclusively, but there are examples of gold 3 chemistry, but within a second year or undergraduate degree, essentially exclusively the chemistry of oxidation state 1. So there are compounds of copper, silver and gold, those are the elements that we're talking about, in oxidation state 1 with carbon ligands, organometallic compounds. And these are actually got really quite a lot of organic synthetic utility. It's true that nowadays there's a huge renaissance occurring in the chemistry of organo gold. Gold has suddenly been decided to be the catalytic metal of choice. And there's a huge bandwagon rolling through the chemistry literature at the moment and a lot of research groups working very strongly in the chemistry of organo gold. So not making jewelry or things, but actual chemical compounds containing gold that can do some really quite exciting catalytic chemistry. So Professor Botman's group, uh, Dr. Bue's group, are both working extensively in the chemistry of organo gold. And it really is one of the hot, exciting areas in synthetic chemistry generally, not just in get organic chemistry. It's the organic chemists who are finding the applications of these gold compounds. But organo copper compounds have been around quite a bit longer, and they can do some really quite interesting chemistry. What are these organocopper reagents? Well, essentially, they tend to be used as organocuprates. An organocuprate is what you get when you take, essentially, an equivalent of a copper-1 halide. So this is copper in oxidation state 1, of course, and an alkyl lithium. That will give you an alkyl copper compound. If you add a second equivalent of an alkyl lithium, then what you get is an anionic copper organometallic compound. So those are described, because they're anionic, as organocuprates. Consistent nomenclature here. Organocuprates are, do some quite interesting synthetic chemistry. Because if you look at this molecule here, this is an alkene in conjugation with a carbonyl group. So how would you expect this alkene in combination with a carbonyl group to react with a Grignard reagent? have an alkene, we have a carbonyl function. How do these species react with Grignard reagents? How does anything react with Grignard reagents? How any carbonyl compound react with Grignard reagents? <coughs> yeah, it adds to the carbonyl, car uh, sorry, the carbon of the carbonyl group. That's how Grignard reagents react. And they would react with this species in exactly the same fashion. But an organocuprate doesn't react in that fashion. It adds in a so-called 1,4 addition. So it will add to this terminal uh, carbon here, which is actually the alkenic carbon. 
So that's a very different, complementary and very desirable synthetic strategy in organic chemistry if you have an alkene in conjugation with a carbonyl like this. Organosilver compounds are accessible through the action of a more electropositive reagent with a silver salt, exactly the same sort of chemistry that we've encountered before. But the thing about organosilver compounds is normally, unless you have a very special organic group, normally organosilver compounds are thermally unstable. So they're stable at relatively low temperatures, but if you warm them up to room temperature, what you get is homolytic cleavage. So if you get a situation where, essentially here this is a shorthand, if you have a silver alcohol compound, let's give this alcohol compound a name, let's say it's a methyl group. What will be my products if I homolytically cleave that bond? Silver and a methyl radical. Now, is a methyl radical a stable species? No. So what will happen is methyl radicals will react with other, one another, and that will make, well, what happens when two methyl radicals react with one another? You'd have ethane. And what do you call it when you don't have one silver radical, but you have lots and lots of silver radicals? What's, yeah, it's silver metal. So what you get are alkanes and silver metal. So these things actually decompose to give us a, a mirror of silver on there. Or occasionally they'll give essentially colloidal silver in your solution. Okay, so we did manage to reach the end of main group organometallic chemistry. Here's our lecture summary slide. Obviously, the take-home messages in here is that we can predict the reactivity of your main group organometallic by looking at it and saying, does it have any vacant orbitals? If it does, the important point about a vacant orbital, of course, is if you're looking at a mechanism, what you need is a low energy mechanism. Now, if you're going to have a reaction before I'd finished, I have almost finished, actually, to be honest. If you have a compound like um, tetramethyl silane, then essentially in order for this species to react, you've got to break one of these silicon carbon bonds. So before any reactivity can take place, you have to put a lot of energy in to break a bond. The difference with aluminium is if you have a trialkyl aluminium compound, then this is already Lewis acid. So you have to put no energy in at all to add a molecule like water to this. Breaking this bond is going to be a very energetic process with a high activation barrier. Adding a water molecule to trimethyl aluminium is going to be a, a practically activation list barrier. There's going to be nothing at all. But once you have a OH bond in the proximity of a metal carbon bond, you can start to use the skills that you have for predicting reactivity, and you will immediately tell me that this bond is polarized delta plus, this is delta minus, this is delta plus, this is delta minus. So how are these beasts going to go together? Well, obviously, these bits are going to react together, and you're going to get a bond formation here. But the key point here is that you have to have a shortcut to the reactivity, which is the actual adduct formation.